Okay, at this point, we're uh, pleased to have Scott Murray, author of the Volatility Analytics Newsletter, join us to talk about, uh, well, you know, VIX, uh, the stock market, and uh, maybe even the bond market a little. And uh, I think he's brought us some charts uh, on this particular stock that's piqued his interest. It's a pleasure having you today, uh, Scott. Welcome to the Market Huddle. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> So um, let's just jump right into it. You're, I, I, I love your letter. You're uh, a, a kind of a S&P slash VIX uh, trader. And uh, for those who don't know, he's the actually on Twitter at the Volatility Wiz. Just quickly, what's your background? Like where did you come about uh, trading volatility in the S&P so much? Well, I started trading uh, during the financial crisis and, and felt, sort of started because coming out of grad school, there were no jobs. So I sat in front of a terminal all day and, and sort of learned it uh, on the fly. Uh, and, uh, you know, volatility is, is basically, you know, um, I don't trade like volatility ETNs or anything like that. It's primarily in the indices. And I, I sort of like look at, you know, what events are on the horizon, whether it be a Fed meeting or, or trying to trade talks and, and try to find like good pricing by pairing up options on the volatility surface. So that, I would say that's probably like 90% of what I do is pairing up options on the surface. Right. That sounds great. So you got some charts for us. Why don't we jump into the first one, which looks near and dear to my heart, which is the TLT. What are you thinking there? Well, I, you know, I drew this, this black line here because like over the fat, over the last five years, like people don't, you know, everyone was talking in August about, oh, what's the Fed think about, you know, does it, is this a signal for the economy? And essentially every year, right, for the last five, uh, the long end of the curve is, is has basically topped around, you know, the end of August. So it's like, it, it's, it should have been more obvious to people that this was just like sort of a seasonal trade. And, uh, you know, the volatility in TLT um, over the last like 10 days is like 16 versus like the S&P is 10. So it's, it's almost like trading, you know, it's trading at a much higher vol, um, than just the regular index, you know, and the, I mean, the reason why SPX fall is low right now is obviously, you know, we're coming towards a uh, quarterly expectation, uh, expiration, but, but, um, yeah, I'm always like on the lookout for volatility, you know, wherever I can find it. Right. So uh, the TLT has been often one of my favorites. Like I, I've long argued that we're going to get a rise in fixed income volatility and especially relative to uh, stock market volatility. I just never expected it to be on the upside so violent. And uh, the move to Aug in August uh, in the in the government bond indexes, it was uh, you know unprecedented. I think it was one of the biggest moves that we've had since the great financial crisis. And it seemed to me that it was just a uh, kind of a low volume, just get me in with no liquidity. Is that what you kind of saw on on in the terms of the volatility? Well, I mean, when you see a move like this, like you see it in a lot of markets these days, whether it be oil or or even in you know the indices, like at the end of last year, it's it's it sort of feels like there there are derivative positions out there. Like there's a lot of gamma that sort of drives. Uh, you know, hedging and rebalancing that sort of causes it. So, I mean, once it gets like sort of like out of a range, like people have to sort of chase just to stay flat. Um, and that's what that sort of felt like to me. Uh, I mean, I don't have any evidence to support that. I mean, that's just what it looks like, you know, and, and it looks like it's reversing that exactly how it occurred like during August. Right. I was out with some pension fund managers the other day and they were trying to argue to me that it was much, uh, much of the move in August was actually uh, mortgage back related and, and they are short gamma, right? The mortgages because of the negative convexity of their portfolios. And they were arguing that that was the majority of the move. So I, really? it, regardless of what it was, it sure was painful for us that, uh, you know, we're trying to, to fade it. But uh, now that we've got some moves the other way, it's, it's finally, you know, eking slowly back on side it is interesting to see this uh, seasonality and i didn't realize how, how prevalent this kind of late summer early september topping formation is and it's, it's a great chart that you brought out one of the things is i kind of mentioned you in the last huddle was because wasn't it you that said i don't know why everyone takes off the last two weeks of august <laughs> well i said that to yeah i did i, I did mention that um 
You know, I, I have a little saying that when people are on vacation, you better be working. So, you know. <laughs> Man, I got that's a lesson that I've got to learn because I like I always take off the last two weeks of August and every time I'm like I never get a vacation because I'm like I, I have to get online and I'm 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 like trading like because the market just doesn't give me a chance, right? It's uh it's insane. Right. I think I'm gonna move my vacations to July and just and just be tra- trading full throttle in August, right? <laughs> right. Okay, I so mean, let's go to the next uh, sir. Hey, Christmas is off uh, is is absolutely christmas to new year's is a great time to be trading i'll tell you i never ever take that off it's, there's always like money on the table really there, there you go really okay so let's go on to your, your next chart which is i i think you brought it up in oh, just real quick real quick yeah sir yeah can i just mention something real quick about yeah. that yeah uh if you had in 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 um the long bond right futures if you had bought like say a 160 a zb 160 put like a week ago you could have got it for like five sixty fourths, and now it's like yeah. two and thirty two, which is like I don't know thirty five hundred percent return. So I mean, even though it's volatile, like something that markets that are more volatile still offer like value buying volatility in gamma. It's it's amazing. So like um, I just figured I would throw that out there in yeah. case people are wondering, you know. When you see this, how do you take advantage of it? Right. Right. For sure. And, uh, you know, I was just amazed at at how one-sided it was and how people were just giving away the puts because they just could never imagine this going any way but up. And it's it's those kind of environments where options are actually the most valuable because it's it's difficult to stay with the short. But if you're long premium, even though it might be expensive premium, it's still worth it because the realized ends up being even more, you know, even higher than what you're paying for the implieds. Yeah, it's it's extraordinary right. that we just so game has been cheap. Yeah, it's extraordinary that the TLT just wiped five dollars in two days. Right. That's uh, that's quite the the pullback. That's right. It's a big right. move. Trading now, like this a, is the opposite. Trading like an IPO. The, yeah. Right. Now, the opposite <laughs> is happening in the, in the S&P, though, right? And uh, you have a theory on as to why that is. Why don't you walk us through what's happening in the S&P? So, yeah, I mean, this is something that I always watch. Like The, the options expiration cycle, to me, is probably the most, I mean, to me, is probably one of the most important drivers of the market. And, and like through like July, I can't remember, you know, the exact number. I think 55% of the return in the S&P came during like the seven OPEX weeks to, uh, year to date. So, I mean, that's where the returns, the, the upside is, is, is happening. Um, and especially at the end of quarter, it tends to be even more exaggerated because you have huge um, option positions open, right, at the end of the quarter. So... So if you look at the chart, you could see like in March, right, the, the third week in March, the third week in June, and then here we are, the third, you know, the third week in September is coming up, and you're just getting these massive rallies that occur then. Um, on top of that, it tends to, you know, as you can see the arrows, after you get past these expirations, then volatility seems to reemerge. So, I mean, this chart just basically – it speaks for itself. I mean, the, the options expiration cycle is like, if you don't know, if you're not aware of it and you're trading like premium long or short, then you're probably, you know, you're going to get hurt. Right. And it grinds higher the, the week of option expiration. Is that what you're basically seeing? And therefore, and, and do you have a theory as to why that is like, what, what's your thinking? Well, there are a lot of structured products out there selling like premium and the market tends to, as long as the dealers have positive gamma, it tends to gravitate to the upper strikes. If, if they're short gamma, then the market's more volatile. So, so, you know, if, if you have to keep that in mind. So, so in the case of, you know, there being like huge open interest at like 3000 and 3050 S and P, you know, the market just wanted to go to those. And then, you know, these these structured condor sellers or volatility sellers, they roll them out and that that forces the the corresponding market maker to like add more futures, which is sort of a prop to it. So it's 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 a function of of 
uh, structured product, you know, search for yield and the corresponding market making uh, hedging activity. Right. Right. And I, I read in your this week's note that you wrote um, your volatility newsletter. I saw that you had mentioned that both Charlie and uh, I could never pronounce the, the J.P. Morgan guy's name. Patrick, why don't you help me out Col- here? What's uh, his name? Col- uh, Marco Kolonovic. Oh, yeah. There you go. You're. Yeah, there you go. You're stumbling on it worse than me. Um, I see that you, they 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 they've actually made careers out of focusing on this, uh, you know, dealer gamma positioning, haven't they? Yeah, well, at least you know, I didn't really know them very well until like the last year. But like this this sort of like market behavior is getting more and more exacerbated. I mean, it was sort of responsible, you know for a lot of what happened last fall. And um, just because, you know, I think Ben Eifert or I, I was watching a Real Vision interview and they were really deep going over how, say, Asian retail uh, demand for structured products is so big that the indices are just being flooded with a premium um, sellers, you know, in different forms. There was actually like an article in, in the journal about uh, people suing UBS for their iron condor selling strategy program, which has basically wiped out a ton of uh, capital since like last August or whatnot. And, and that's what happens when you have moves that are like straight down and then straight up like we had. So, um, the, you know, at some point, at some point, there's just too much and the, the indices can't handle it. Right We're now, not so there how yet do you... in the S&P, but... Right. So what what do you look for in trades to take advantage of this kind of phenomenon? Well, the easiest sort of setup, right, would be looking two weeks. If if the market is, is fallen two weeks before expiration, then you start looking to the long side, right? I mean, how do you do it? I mean, there's a million ways to do it. And you can just buy calls. I mean, in a lot of cases, that just that's, works. But... And you could sell, you know, bear puts, uh, bull put spreads or, or, or flies. There's all, you know, whatever your preferred method of, of targeting something 50 to 100 points higher, if that's the magnitude of the drop you got. And that's precisely what we saw, like in August, right? Right, right, right. Now, one of the, th- one of the trades I saw that you were chatting about recently was this idea about um, the FOMC and the fact that maybe with, you can get uh, the, the spread between the uh, option that expires the, the week before or a couple of days before is much uh, too low versus this one that trades after. Are those the kind of trades that you're often looking at? Like, is that, is that typical of a trade, the, your kind of bread and butter trade? At least someone reads my letter. Wow, that's nice to hear. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it's good stuff. I like, yeah, I, so, you know, I love seeing those kind of things where you're looking at the intricacies of of the option market and how it might not be priced. You know, they just put the same volatility on the uh, kind of the 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 one week versus the other week yeah. without thinking about the, yeah. the events that are occurring there. Yeah. So, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, in a wonkier way, like I do look at the the surface of all, which is basically like, like a uh, saying that I'm looking at, you know, different prices, volatility prices, like over time. So, so if, if the Fed meeting has, you know, a higher expectation for movement, you know, maybe I could like sell something, you know, shortly after that and buy something when volatility is expected to be lower and the difference in price, right, will be small. So I think the trade I put in there was something like 2875 S and S and P 500 index puts, right? Where uh, it was like two, it cost me like two and a half index points to put that on. Whereas right. that spread, right, mon- next Monday and Wednesday, the same spread, like a week earlier, is like worth like six or seven dollars. So you get the idea of like, you know how much risk you're taking, right? 250 versus what you can get, you know, um, in a very short period of time. That's sort of like my bread and butter trade is, you know, pairing up SVX uh, put options. Right. Okay. So then the next trade you have is, yeah, no, it's actually great. It's, 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 I love it. And it's uh, all those kind of trades are, are interesting and, and, 
and something that those who are a little more technical inclined should definitely check out. Your next chart that you brought to with us is the Amazon, the good old Jeff Bezos uh, stock. What are you thinking there? What are you What are you watching? Well, there's some things that seem to work, like you know, year after year, and and this one is you know just like the Apple event. It's a tradable. It's a tradable event, right? Because there's going to be volatility in the back. And you could sell some in the front. And in, in any event, in this trade, basically, the, you could see um, all the CNET and all those sites were, you know, leaked out when the prime day was going to be, right? And uh, if you just took a long there and wrote it through prime day, uh, you have the cover of earnings right behind it. So people don't really want to sell like before earnings, I mean, you see that in the, in the FANG space all the time, right? They just ride it into earnings. They'll sell after, okay? But no one really wants to be short before it. Um, and on top of that, you have, you know, people that that are anticipating, you know, every year that this company is going to do a larger sales number, and 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 they're looking toward they're looking towards that, right? So this this if, if you look really to the left, right, at June and July of the year prior, I mean, it worked then as well so it's something that th this is the kind of thing that i'll like keep a spreadsheet of like trading notes and i'll say all right next june keep your eye on this because if there's a dip then you know in may or something that you might want to get long like think about prime day right that you know that that's a great piece of advice and something i don't do nearly enough because there are those trades that seem so obvious and seem so clear and and yet then you kind of the next year comes around and you're like, why didn't I, you know, do that? And it's the discipline of, of keeping notes and going back and actually executing that trade that matters. And, uh, you know, I commend you for it. Uh, the, I have a question in terms of, do you think that once this trade stops to work, it'll be the end of the bull market? Like, is it like what I worry about with this is that it'll, it'll work until I do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say, you know what, uh, I was sort of thinking about that today um, with this trade. I was thinking that if this doesn't work, then something's really wrong because yeah. that means that people are scared about their earnings prospects, right? For Amazon. And if Amazon is going to have, you know, a poor earnings report, that's basically goes right to the heart of, of the American consumer. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, listen for the, thank you so much for joining us. Why don't you tell us a little bit where the people can find you? I know you're on Twitter and you also have a website and a letter that I highly recommend. Why don't you uh, go ahead and tell people where they can find you? Well, basically I'm just on Twitter. So the Twitter handle is at volatility whiz and, uh, and you're active and uh, I highly recommend people that, uh, to go out and check you out. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Scott. And for those who want to hear more about Scott, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit of hockey because he is from Boston in the after hours. Make sure you stick around.